Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Is it possible to travel to parallel worlds while meditating? If so, can you get stuck there? Are scientists all wrong when they say we need complex machinery in order to travel through time? Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the 135th broadcast of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Paul, and after an absence of several weeks because of his exotic travels, drumroll please, I'm glad to be here with my co-host, partner in the paranormal, and my son, Ben. Now, Ben, some of your activities on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona are relevant to today's theme. You meditated at Canyon de Chez and did a sweat lodge. Uh, I, I did a lot of things. I... Well, besides doing service work for the Navajo people, it was it was pretty cool stuff. Like I just meditated all over the place. Cool. Like there was this one spot like near a playground, and it was like right near like right. I could see like the sun sunrise, and I was just like chilling there, and it was cool. It was awesome stuff. Beautiful. Yes, and um, but all, but before we welcome our guests, let's do our weekly paranormal contest. There's no current winner because we did a rerun la- rerun last week. But this week's question is, in what U.S. state was a monster of this description seen by many people in the 1970s? Three legs, two pink eyes, as big as flashlights, and short arms on a a four-and-a-half-foot-tall body, which was grayish colored. Now, that's... My cat would know that, because maybe it was my cat. Call us locally at 401-766-1240 or nationally, 800-449-1240. Or email us at eno at onworldwide.com. If nobody gets it before the end of the show, drop a line to Ben at ben at behindtheparanormal.com. The winner gets a copy of A Complete Guide to Fairies and Magical Beings by Cassandra Eason, our guest on tomorrow night's show on CBS. Now, that show doesn't have a contest, so this is our only chance to give the book away. Anyhow, back to today. We welcome two guests uh, this morning, uh, both of whom teach at the International Metaphysical University and are co-authors of the book, Through the Eyes of a Traveler. John Terry was born in Germany, the third of eight children in an American military family. He studied electronics technology at what is now Utah Valley University and and he studied business administration at the University of Phoenix. He chose his career in the computer industry and eventually owned his own company, which developed automated law codification and publishing software for counties and cities, uh, which he later sold to the largest municipal code publishers in the U.S. He went on to, in his career to chair the project management office for a billion-dollar corporation. Now, all this time, he anxiously awaited the opportunity to focus all his attention on his life's passion, the mind and mind travel, finally retiring five years ago. And as uh, John puts it himself, he loves God, family, country, music, poetry, and literature in that order. Sounds good to me. I might move literature a little bit farther. He and his wife, Mikey, are the parents of nine children and six grandchildren. Uh, Bonnie Adams was born in Indiana, the youngest of 13 children. She earned a B.A. in business administration. She is the mother of two children and has four grandchildren. Bonnie is active in the community and is certified in CPR and respite, or respite, whatever. Respite. Respite. I got that. Uh, Relaxation techniques. Her interests include oil painting, photography, music, outdoor sports, and traveling. John and Bonnie, welcome to Behind the Paranormal. Thank you. Thank you. Now, John, one thing, what what is your website? We had trouble with the one that was advertised. I want to make sure that everybody knows about your website. Well, it's uh, respite. MindTravel.com. Uh, respite is R E S P I T E, all one word. Okay, very good. Okay, well, Ben, uh, take it away. All right. What do you mean by the term mind travel? Well, um, just as it uh, as it speaks, uh, using the mind, projecting the mind uh, to some other place and time. That's, that's in simplest uh, terms, that's what mind travel is all about. So how do you know it's not just daydreaming on steroids? Well, because we have uh, many occasions where we've had multiple people join us as opposed to just Bonnie and I uh, in mind travels. And when you have more than one 
person going to the same place, seeing the same things, experiencing the same uh, events and personality, you tend to believe that it's not just uh, one person's fantasy. Okay. Uh, again, I'm going to have to ask you to speak up as we go. We've got a double connection here. Now, Bonnie, uh, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Good. You want to? Uh, can you amplify at all what uh, John's saying? Like, what? What? what how, how would you define mind travel? It just sounds kind of simple, but could you go into it a little bit? Well, actually, uh, I go into a relaxed state. Um, John has basically he guides me to uh, places and um, time uh, in uh, past in the future, in the present, uh, places that I've never been or have read about. And um, somehow, um, through the energy, I believe, of the mind, um, I am able to go there and describe what I see, uh, what I feel, what I touch. Uh, basically, I have all my senses uh, as just as though I were in the same room with you. Okay, uh, Ben's got another question here, but before that, uh, what's the difference between this and dreaming? Well, in dreaming, um, sometimes my dreams are, are, are very real, and um, you know, but other times, you know, they're kind of um, funky. I mean, you know, they're all mixed up and and such. This isn't like dreaming. This is like being in the same room with a person and talking to them. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's like being in their dimension, whatever that dimension happens to be. Well, if I can insert here, it, it's interesting that you ask that question because um, I, I don't dream very often, at least that I can remember. Um, but the, the dreams that I do remember are very real, very vivid. In fact, it, as you ask, What's the difference? Uh, the, the only difference I can think of is that there is another person involved. Uh, with respect to Bonnie, it's me, and so I'm I'm guiding her. I'm asking her questions. I'm asking her to describe the things that are going on in her experience. I'm directing her to look for specific things that we're interested in, and so, well, you know, it, it's a it's a difficult question to answer because. The, the experience, as Bonnie has expressed, is very real for her, very vivid. And the only difference I can imagine uh, to answer the question is that I'm involved. Okay. So how many dreams do you have that you have someone outside of your dream telling you where to go and what to, what to look for? Well, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know Ben and I very well, but we're, we're, we're on the same page as you. You might be surprised how, how, how closely we... we uh... We might agree with you on, on all these things. Uh, I know I'm. I'm Ben's got another question here, but I, I just this keeps coming up. Uh, now you you both are lo you're located in two different states, right? No, same state. Oh, you are. Okay, so when you meditate, do you meditate together, or you just I mean together physically in the same yes. same room? Yes. Oh, we, you do. Okay. We right. we meet together regularly in order to continue on with the experiences. Oh, okay. So when you say you meet others or travel with others, are these people in the same room also? Yes. Oh, they are? Okay. Oh, that's right, because we've uh, often, at least, you know, I, I, well, whatever, we'll get into that later. Ben, go right ahead. All right. So what's the connection you see with UFOs? Yeah, your, your, your literature, you know, your website says that you see a connection here with UFOs. You say what is the connection? Yeah. Or what connection well, do you see there? We uh, initially, when Bonnie and I first met about 10 years ago, um, I had a list of curiosities, and I'm, I'm very uh, peculiar perhaps in my list. I know that most people have a, a list of curiosities, even though it may not be a formal list like mine was. But when I discovered uh, that Bonnie could do what she could do in the way that she could do it, uh, we spent every, we happened to meet at work, we spent every day at our lunch break uh, doing these mind travels. And so UFOs weren't the very first uh, items of interest on my list. But eventually we got to UFOs, and uh, when we did, uh, 
we began to, to look into the, the many and varied uh, UFOs and aliens that exist out there. Uh, I didn't know beforehand that there were such things. Uh, I always had a an inkling that, that they existed, <clears throat> but didn't know that, that they were in such a wide variety as we discovered. And just uh, over a year ago, uh, we decided to do a newsletter for our the people who are interested, and uh, specifically focused on UFOs. And for a whole year, that's all we did was UFO, uh, mind travel. And then we put a book together, which is our third book, called UFOs Through the Eyes of a Traveler. And, uh, and then we came across the uh, IMU. Uh, the university asked us to come on board, and that was uh, what they asked us to teach was in their ufology department. Okay. Yeah, well, I want to you know, give a plug for that at the end. Okay. Uh, a number of questions are opening up here. Uh, we have files full of cases where people seem to stumble into parallel worlds. What's the difference between that and people doing it deliberately through meditation or other alternate states of consciousness? In other words, how can I clarify that? What's the difference between people? There are a lot of people who want to do it but can't, and other people just sort of, you know, they trip over a brick and all of a sudden they're in some other world. I mean, we get a lot of reports of that sort of thing I've seen over the last 40 years of my work. Uh, what, what are the mechanics behind this? What are the nuts and bolts? How does it work? Well, are, are you assuming that, that what we're doing is we project our minds is a parallel world? Is that what you're saying? Uh, we tend to have a prejudice in that direction, yeah. <laughs> Well, Bonnie's probably the best one to answer is she's the one that experiences it most often. Okay. Take it away, Bonnie. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, repeat the question for me again. <laughs> I'm not sure I can. Okay. He, he there, just wants to know what's the process. Yeah, there, what, as I say, there, there are a lot of cases we have in our files of people who, who inadvertently find themselves in... Uh, parallel world neighborhoods or buildings that don't exist in our world or, or some other alternate reality or alternate parallel world, whatever puny words you want to use to describe these things. At the same time, there are other people who, you know, try to do what you do and can't do it. I mean, what, what you know, how come it's easier for some and not others, and what is it that's actually happening here? Well, I think uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, if people are really... If they're trying it and it doesn't happen, it could be a number of reasons. It could be because um, they can't uh, they can't relax. They have uh, uh, problems that keep coming into their minds, and they can't c- seem to clear their minds of of this world, uh, right. so to speak. Uh, Bonnie, Bonnie brings up me, a really um, important issue. Okay. I, you know, there there are a lot of things with me. <laughs> uh, I can uh, not only go into a relaxed state where I'm not even uh, aware of anything other than where I am and somehow I can hear John's voice. Uh, one time, um, for example, he relaxed me uh, on our lunch hour. Uh, we both worked for the same corporation and met at lunch. And apparently right next, uh, and we were in my car, and apparently right next to us, somebody was digging up cement, started digging up cement, and it didn't phase me at all. I didn't even know. Well, I envy of that. <laughs> and, uh, so um, to say why do some stumble into it, um, they might just have that ability. Okay. Uh, and and uh, I believe everybody has the ability, but some people just can't seem to clear their minds of the everyday problems and issues that come up, and, and therefore you have to completely clear your mind of everything and just just allow the, the thoughts to flow. Okay. You know? Ben, do you have any questions on that? Uh, well, let, let me insert uh, yeah, just please. to amplify what you're saying. Um, I believe that there is a, a full, a very wide spectrum of ability here. Uh, myself, being on one end, Bonnie and other people, uh, I haven't met very many people that have the ability like Bonnie, but they're on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, in the in the first book, 
there's a whole chapter on what I call analysis paralysis, and that's where <laughs> I fit. I, I'm one of those. I'm yeah, a me too. I'm a computer analyst. Yeah. I, I like to ask questions. I like to, to get down to the nuts and bolts and, and find out how and why. And there are a lot of people like that, doctors, lawyers, uh, especially engineers. Um, so uh, on one end of the spectrum with me, uh, we, we tend to analyze to the nth degree, and that gets in the way. It gets in the way of relaxing and, as Bonnie was describing, getting rid of all the all the, the uh, interference that can take place when you're, when you're not allowing your mind to totally relax. On the other end of the spectrum with Bonnie, there are those who, like she said, we, we were, it, it disturbed me, and I was so surprised when it didn't disturb her. We actually had three people in the car doing a travel at the same time, and the other person uh, was distracted by the noise. But who Bonnie was driving? Was, What's that? Who was driving? Well, <laughs> we we were parked. Good. So we were we were off in a in a little remote place so that we could relax without being disturbed by traffic. But not too far distant was the jackhammer going off trying to dig up some some part of the road. And uh, my other friend came out of his trance, and Bonnie stayed in, and so we just continued to ask her questions. Didn't phase her at all. So the the spectrum is is deep and wide, and some people have the knack, and others it takes some time and practice to, to get into it. Okay. Oh, now I, can I finally answer? Yes, I'm question? sure. All right, yeah. Um, so what my my last question, I guess, is um, can people get stuck in like a parallel world, or that they can just travel to a parallel world and they can't get out? Well, that, that's a very interesting question. I also uh, answer that question in the first book as well. Uh, there are, there have been several times when Bonnie has been uh, not only in a trance, but actually in a trance uh, with her eyes open, walking around as we were trying to discover a place that had some hidden records. Um, and I, I got so involved with some place that she had pointed out, and I was had my shovel digging. <laughs> And another friend was watching Bonnie, not really knowing that she had this ability, and uh, he was afraid that she was going to stumble over something and, and was trying to wake her up, uh, which he couldn't do because Bonnie, in that trance, doesn't really listen to anyone else but me uh, for some interesting reason. And so it, it took me to come over and, and bring her out of the trance so that she wouldn't fall over a cliff or stumble into a hole or something. Um, so the answer is uh, that's one of the reasons why we, we, why we do this in pairs, because usually there are those with the greater gift, and, there, and most people bring to this uh, different gifts. So my gift, the, the, the inquisitor side of me, uh, has the ability to, to actually go into a trance, but not as deep as what Bonnie does. And I can, I can actually recognize things going on in the environment around me where she can't. So it, you can do this all by yourself, and we, we've experienced that, but it's so important to do it with someone else just because of the very issue that you bring up. That actually rings true in my experience. Uh, it's always best to have some. Even, even when you meditate, you know, I kind of keep an eye very yeah. often. But in my experience, uh, that, that's it's always you're absolutely right. It's always good to have someone there who kind of knows how things work. Even with the, I even noticed that in shamanic activities with sh with shamans, you know, somebody's there who can tell you don't touch him now or her or whatever and and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, now, just before we move on, I wanted to get a little deeper into this, but when I, when I met, first mentioned the idea of, of uh, parallel worlds, multiverse kind of thing, you seem to uh, express a sort of grim jocularity. Now, now am, I, am I misreading you, or, or do you think of this as something else? Well, uh, I, I've never really connected this with parallel universes, although I understand what they are. Uh, we've we've uh, had some some deep interest into that. What, what I understand, what we've come to understand that, that this is, is simply the ability, once the mind is relaxed to, the, to a certain level, to project 
the mind, not the spirit, not any kind of astral projection. Gotcha. We, we understand what astral projection is. Been there, done that. This is not astral projection. The spirit's not leaving the body. This is the mind being projected to another place in time. So, and we think, we understand that it's in this universe and not another universe. Why do you think that? Well, the fact that we're we're in, as I think of parallel universes, I think of uh, the decision tree, and if we had made some different decision back in some other some point in our life, then we so there are other universes that that exist that would have taken that that different route, but we are in the universe that that took a different decision or the different route, and so the other universe has a whole different decision tree. If that's if I'm understanding your your oh uh, yeah, I, that that that's one of the standard interpretations, and well, we go a lot farther with that. Um, and it's I think the the parallel world experience is a lot more intimate to most people than you might think. But again, you know, we're banding terms. I mean, the experience is the experience, and you might call it one thing, we might call it something else. But you know, sure. it, it is what it is. Okay, so 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 I I hear you there. Um, now, let, I don't. Do you, do you want to? Talk about some of your own experiences, or well, do you have anything else to ask? Well, no. Well, I, well, no. What do I mean? What do I mean? I got lots of things to ask, but um, I wanted well, to get like, to this email that's rather probably, long. We should probably do it like after the break, then. Like okay. Why don't we end. do? Why don't we take a commercial break? We'll be right back to talk about this fascinating subject on behind the paranormal here on W O N twelve forty A M and O N Worldwide dot com. Stay New River Press is proud to sponsor tonight's segment of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Benjamin Eno. New River Press offers the best in unusual New Age books. Stand by the side of tonight's host, Paul Eno, as he battles poltergeists and helps suffering souls and families in the critically acclaimed books Faces at the Window and Footsteps in the Attic. Plunge deeper into the paranormal with Paul and learn about his influence on human history, its action in our daily lives, and its ultimate meaning for us in the best-selling Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. Available now from New River Press, publishers of unusual books. Visit NewRiverPress.com, Amazon.com, or your favorite bookstore. And set for release late this year in one of the most unusual books on the subject ever written, Paul gives us Dancing Past the Graveyard, What Ghosts Have to Say About God. New River Press is proud to... And we have returned Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. And Ben, did you want to... um Give one or two thoughts. I, I don't know if you heard uh, our, our, our two guests were on the line, I guess, when Ben was um, uh, saying a few words about his recent experience in Arizona at the Navajo Reservation. We were without him on the air for a couple of weeks uh, as he traveled. And uh, just tell us a bit about what you did down there meditation-wise. Uh, meditation-wise, right. Well, like, I didn't have a lot of time to meditate because it, we have to get up at, like, 7.30 in the morning, shower, eat, and then immediately leave to go work. But that few minutes I had between, like, getting ready for whatever we were going to do that day, like, I'd just go out, this, there was this little, like, playground thing, like, near this Hogan, that's like a little meeting place or whatever that we had, and we'd eat all the meals there and stuff and have community time and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we go out, i go out to, like, this little play- playground thing, and there was this nice little hill next to it, and I'd look straight out at the sunrise. And I'd just be sitting there, and I'd just be at one with everything around me because it was so quiet and so, like, open. And there wasn't cell phone service within 20 miles of the place. So it was just so quiet, except every time, like, I'd get so into it, I'd start, like, I'd see, like, this purple, like, sunrise or whatever, or whatever thing came to my mind, or I saw, like, this dog, like, a dog would always come over to me and start licking me. Every time... A dog would just come over and lick my face. I'm just like, you're kidding me. And so that was, besides that, I meditated in the sweat lodge. And that was pretty cool. Especially since, like, after every round, there were less and less people. So towards the end, there were only about seven people in the sweat lodge itself. Because people were like, oh, my God, it's so hot in here. And, like, when I was just chilling there, I felt, like, so purified by it. Because you sweat out all the impurities in your body. And it's just so relaxing and i was just like chilling out and going all over the place in my head and i don't i don't really remember anything about it to be honest all i remember was running in and out of the sweat lodge that was about it yeah ben does not have a problem with analysis paralysis his father does 
So what what what, what do you what do you think, uh, John and Bonnie, uh, about uh, the the, the um, value of the environment such as Ben was experiencing in the experience of mind travel? Oh, which one of us do you want to answer? <laughs> no, I, either one. Okay, I recently went to uh, Sedona, and um, uh, they have a lot of spiritual energy there. And um, as as I was uh, hiking uh, up to see the Kachina woman, which is supposed to be very spiritual, uh, and, and a lot of the energy there, there were places there that um, it happened two or three times when I felt, I almost felt as though I could fly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and there was one point that I can relate with your son on this, um, I, it, but I don't remember it. That, that's what was funny. Um, my companion that was with me, um, I, I remember feeling the peace. But when I was talking to him yesterday, he said, Do you, are you aware, he said, do you remember what you were saying when when you went and sat down on uh, the rock? I remember sitting on a rock. And I said, what I was saying, I was just feeling the peace that was there and looking at the mountains and, and uh, you know, the beauty. And he said, you started talking in a strange language. And he said, you had your hand up. And you were pointing to the mountain, and I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, you don't remember that? And I said, no, I was just so caught up with staring at the, you know, everything that was around me and how beautiful it was that um, I, I I don't remember that. So I think it, it's very possible that, you know, uh, when, you're, when you're having these uh sensations as your son did where he saw the the purple sunset or the purple sunrise uh this this can happen with your mind i don't know if it's a parallel universe that you go into or you just slip back into a certain period of time i don't know what it is well i always thought that there are reasons why the native americans say considered a place sacred as opposed they consider the whole planet sacred the whole world but Certain places like Canyon de Chez or wherever the tribe happened to be, uh, because maybe uh, as it was, it's been told to me by natives, these were thin places where the boundaries between worlds tend to thin for one reason or another, and it's easier to cross them. And the point, I guess, the next question is, uh, what is the point of doing this? Where does this get us spiritually or anything else? And our personal opinion is that with the parallel world thing, we exist in many of these worlds, and the more we come together with ourselves in these other worlds, the more wisdom we have, the more uh, experience we have, the greater the imagination, and uh, the, the bigger we become, literally. The, the problem is that in our society, and I worked in many psychiatric hospitals over the years, that the question might arise, uh, are, are people are people like ourselves actually having these experiences, or are we just playing nuts? You know? And uh, in, in native cultures people like this would have been considered holy and in our culture we lock them away and you know fill their pills full of librium and stuff and they're they're schizos okay and uh, when I worked in psychiatric hospitals as a grad student it was many years ago there were more inpatients than today but this question arose in my mind almost from day one are these people crazy or are they really having legitimate experiences the rest of us are too dumb to even you know realize they're true so what say you What's crazy and what's not? Well, I think that people that are having these experiences um, where they feel that way, I think it's more of an awakening. Um, I, I, I don't know how else to describe it, but I, I know that there are people that just go through their lives and they're so scientific and they think, oh, well, this can't happen if, if you do something like this or, uh, you, you know, you are nuts. But I don't feel that's the case. I think there are certain people that all of a sudden at a point in their life, maybe, um, I don't know how to describe it, other than it that it could be an awakening in us. Mm. It's uh, an awakening, uh, an awareness in us that we have, we have uh, the ability to do these things. Okay, John, you have any thoughts on that? 
Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> because because I am one of those analytic types, uh, it took me probably a good 17 or 18 years to, to get past my own um, analytics so that I could actually enjoy the experience. And it wasn't until I met Bonnie. Uh, I tried many, many times, but it wasn't until I met Bonnie and and she was able to help me to relax and get over my analytic uh, needs that I that I began to uh, truly experience what the mind travel phenomenon is all about. Um, I, I think I had before, but it, it took such a long time for me to, to just let go and accept what was coming into my mind. And, and, and because we do it in pairs, um, as Bonnie and I would travel together, I would, I usually, because of the way my mind is organized, I usually arrived at wherever we were going first, and I would begin to describe the little that I could describe of what was in my mind. And I just finally um, let go, per se, and began, as I began to describe it, she, more times than not, would would join in and say, oh, and by the way, did you notice, and would begin to describe the same things that I was just describing, which gave me confidence to believe that what I was seeing was real, because someone else was seeing it too. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so that's another reason why we, we uh, suggest that you do it in pairs, is mm-hmm. because you can, you can uh, validate the other person, especially someone like me, who couldn't believe it, was skeptical about the whole thing, because I never experienced it myself, and now that I have, and with someone like Bonnie, I I, I can help other people who, who get so tied down with uh, analytical uh, needs that they just they just don't let it happen. Okay. So it, it's a it's a very strange and very fascinating thing to, for someone like me to finally experience it because you have to let go of all the of, of everything that you hold on to to experience it. Okay. And obviously, Bonnie doesn't have that problem because she experiences it so easily. Mm-hmm. But people like me, in order to, to really get into it, you just have to let go of everything you know and every and anything that flows into your mind, you accept it. Whether it's, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, you accept it, and then if someone else is there with you that can either validate or say, well, I, I don't quite see what you're seeing, right. um, it, it, it helps. It helps create that confidence that lets you go go even further. Okay, very good. I want to share with you and everyone else one of the most beautiful emails we've ever received. This came in the other day, and I, now whether it was aimed at somebody who was going to listen to this show and, and, and wanted to ask you in particular, but let me just read this. This is from uh, Lisa Wayland or Walland in Oregon. And uh, Lisa writes, uh, Dear Paul and Ben, I have gotten so much from your show, and I have had lifelong paranormal experiences. My father passed away, uh, passed over on my birthday in 1994. He and I shared a psychic bond since I was born. After he died, he contacted me in dreams many times. One of these times was so amazing that even today I get tears in my eyes thinking about it. I need to find out what you think happened. Did I go to, quote, the other side, or did my father bring his world to me? My father was a railroad engineer. He started out in steam, and so after he passed, uh, I would meditate and send him a big, bright Jupiter steam engine. That's, well, that's that's a kind of an old steam engine, (laughs) complete with bunting and ribbons of yellow roses, his favorite, and even a brass band on the deck of the depot. I would say in my mind, that's for you, Dad, that's for you. And I would believe in my heart that he somehow saw that on the other side. Well, Paul and Ben, you're probably not going to believe this, but I was meditating one morning, and I was deep yet alert, and suddenly I popped into another world. I was fully lucid, and I was standing on a vast plain, like a desert with scrub brush. Everything was hyper real. I could feel the hot wind on my face and see the bright blue sky. In the distance, I saw a dust trail and something coming toward me. My father had raced Harleys when he was young, and I could make out a motorcycle coming toward me. When it got up to me, to my amazement, my father was on it. He was young, about 23. He died at 78. He had hair. He was dressed in leathers and looked so good. He said, 
with a big smile on his face, hi, honey, get on back and hold on. I have something to show you. Well, you know, I, I, I used to get to this point and I'd say, oh, brother, you know, what's going on here? You know, the, uh, the afterlife where you can eat all the cake you want and not get fat and all that. But, you know, people have pointed out to me, if, if, gee, Paul, if your ideas about the multiverse are correct, this is absolutely real and happening all over because, you know, we're in all these different worlds. So anyway, uh, Lisa goes on. Paul and Ben, I could even smell the leather of his jacket and the exhaust of the bike. I got on my back, on the back, and we rode a ways till we got to what looked like a cliff up ahead. Dad stopped the bike and put his arm around me and walked with me to the edge of this cliff. I started to cry. I, I'm starting to cry as I write this, as it was so unbelievably beautiful and so unlike anything on earth. I could even begin to compare it with. You have to understand that when I was a child and all through my life, my favorite thing of all has been Pegasus. That's the winged horse of Greek mythology. I just adore horses with wings. Well, my father brought me over to this cliff, and when I looked over the edge, down below me, stretched out hundreds of feet below, was this valley of unearthly beauty. There were mountains of tremendous size, just huge, on either side of this valley, and they were all covered with trees and rich green, and far below was a silvery river flowing down the middle of this valley, and there was a golden pink light shining down, making everything glow. The sky was so blue, the clouds were big, cauliflower clouds, just perfect. And Dad said, Honey, look. I looked where he directed me to, and there on the valley below, on a marble flat-topped pyramid of steps, was a giant white pegasus. It was so wonderful. It was levitating in place about 50 feet above this marble platform, and it was hundreds of feet high. It was caught at mid-leap like it was taking flight. <coughs> Excuse me. Its wings were outstretched and hundreds of feet across. This is so weird, too, even though it was far away. I could see every little detail on it like I was up close. Okay, I'm going to stop here now. Now, have you two experienced anything like this or heard anyone who has? Or, or I mean, this just seems to me... So beautiful and so textbook multiverse that I just wanted to get your thought on it. I mean, there's more, but well, the first thing that comes to my mind <clears throat> is that uh, on occasion, uh, both Bonnie and I, as we travel together, uh, find ourselves on another planet. It's not this planet. We know it's not this planet because there's a, I, I uh, there, there, the colors that exist on this planet are nothing like Earth colors. Um, and yet, we, we've been there many times, uh, experienced uh, everything about this planet. It, it's such a, a wonder and a beauty. Um, with respect to the, the Pegasus, the winged horse, we've never seen anything like that, at least I haven't. Um, but, yes, we've traveled to uh, other places, other planets, um, we don't just go back and, and forth in time on the Earth. There are so many other uh, very fascinating planets to uh, to deal with as well as this Earth. Uh, Bonnie? Um, that's just what I was basically thinking about. Uh, she traveled to a different planet. Um, as for seeing her father young, um, our spirits within us are, in, uh, you know, eternally young. And um, it's, it's my belief that uh, those spirits can appear to us in uh, forms in dreams or, you know, however they happen to appear to us in, in forms that are recognizable by us. Uh, for example, if a, her father appeared to her as, you know, just well, he, she would have to know him, you know, and obviously she knew him when he was young because she was young. And she had those memories there. So for him to appear to her in the spirit form in that way, um, that's quite acceptable. See, that's where um, we that's where we differ. I see. I don't I don't put much stock in the spirit thing. I think that these these are in our experience, my experience. These are actual physical parallel worlds, in some of which we are very aware of the others. You know, and there's one component nobody's mentioned here yet, including me, and that's love. Love puts to rest all analysis paralysis. And believe me, you know, my long scholarly approach to this took a long time to learn that, you know. And uh, the love that exudes from this experience is just breathtaking, in my opinion. Ben, you any thoughts on it? 
I don't know. It's just, the only thing I had to say is, like, as Buddha said, love and compassion for all things. Absolutely. That's it. That's it. So, uh, this does go on, uh, and if, if uh, I just think it, it is beautiful, and if you, you don't mind me continuing a little bit here. Oh, no. Uh, I still haven't figured... <coughs> excuse me again. I still haven't figured out that one, seeing every detail on this Pegasus figure. I could see... Uh, its eyes, they looked so alive. I could see the individual features on its wings. They were iridescent, like abalone shell. I guess you have to be a Californian to understand what that. That's a kind of a... What, do you live in California? No, actually, we live in Utah. Oh, we're not close enough to the Pacific. Anyway, it's a big shellfish with beautiful shell. It looked like it was alive. It was slowly revolving around in place, and it had a star above its forehead that was shooting out streams of iridescent light. Yeah, one can go crazy with symbolism here if you tried. There was a thundering sound with a star, and I could even make out the individual hairs on its mane and tail as they blew in the wind. It was beyond any earthly beauty. I have done a poor job of telling you both how incredibly supernaturally beautiful this Pegasus was. It was just so big. My father turned to me and said, Lisa, that's for you, honey. That's for you. And he gave me a smile and told me he had gotten all the steam trains I had sent him, his eyes had no weight in them, no heaviness. They were absolutely clear and so full of pure happiness and love. I came out of my trance and just sat there crying and laughing. It was the most wonderful experience of my life. And there's a little, there's a little bit more. And, you know, people would say, oh, it's sappy and it's this. And, you know, I used to say that. But, you know, there are times, as I say, when you have to put away, as, as we were talking about, John, the, the analysis and just have the experience, you know. Right. Right. And uh, I think, yeah. again, I think these worlds are real. We live in them, too. These are loved ones who can reach us from there, and we should just rejoice in it, you know. Well, Actually, um, oh, I saw oh. my father, um, well, I didn't know that he had died at the time, uh, but um, we were in the military, my husband and I, and uh, I came home to have my first child. And um, I was uh, at my in-laws, and um, I was up with uh, the baby at night, and I was sitting on the sofa uh, feeding her, and I saw my father standing in the doorway. Well, my father had had a stroke, and he was paralyzed, and I was on the second floor of an old Victorian home, so there was no way that my father could have gotten up there, okay, logically. Mm-hmm. And I I looked up, and he was smiling at me, and I said, uh, Daddy, what do you, how did you get up here? You know, is is Mom with you? And and he didn't answer, and I said, let me put the baby down. And I tucked her, turned around, tucked her in the, you know, the sofa there, so, and uh, went to get up and help him, and he was gone. And uh, it was a few moments, well, it was probably a bit minutes later, probably about 10 minutes later. I mean, I looked all over the place and couldn't find him. The phone rang, and it was my sister, and she, you know, she said, Bonnie, she said, uh, Dad passed away. And I said, no, he didn't. He was here, you know. <laughs> and um, she said, no, he passed away, and and she told me what time and that was just about the time that i'd seen my father well yeah very very very, uh common and and beautiful story now the question arises here too of uh, should everyone try and do this i mean it seems like one of the most important things we have to do is keep our feet on the ground and not get carried away what's your advice for someone starting out in meditation uh and of course there are many kinds of meditation there are many ways to begin uh, if it starts taking people in this direction, do you have any warnings for them? Any particular advice? Well, other than um, reading your books. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> number one that's advice. The, the best best way to start off. Um, yeah, the the biggest advice is to to make sure that you you have some kind of uh, experiential knowledge coming from someone who's already been there, done that. Uh, because if you're if you're doing it by yourself, as I was 25 years ago, you you tend to bump into into walls and and you're not sure what you're doing and and you you make mistakes and not that it's dangerous or, or there's any risk involved, but uh, with the exception of what you said, you know you could get lost within yourself. Um, 
Yeah, the, the best advice is just to uh, find out what others have done so that you can at least start where they left off. Okay. One of the dangers I find, and th this uh, International Metaphysical University where you teach and where I teach too, actually, one course so far, is that um, I think they're very careful whom they put on the faculty. So uh, one of the warnings for any kind of training in anything paranormal that I've always given is, you know, uh, you don't end up with somebody who's incompetent, who learned from someone just as incompetent as they are and made stuff up as they went along and all this but and I generally, anybody associated with IMU, I would give certainly a qualified nod to as, as being very carefully vetted and this sort of thing. So tell us about what courses you're offering there at, at International Met, which is intermetu.com. And what, what courses are you offering there? Well, currently, <clears throat> we, we've just, uh, just become involved with IMU within the last uh, couple of months. Uh, and we are uh, only in the ufology department with Susan Rawling. Oh, yeah, uh, we know teaching, Sue. What's that? I said, we know Sue. She's been a guest. Yeah. Uh, and we're, we're currently teaching uh, the uh, 501 course that's called, uh, let's see, what have they got it called? Um, it's just the UFO 501 mind travel course. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just teaching the advanced techniques of uh, mind traveling to find uh, UFOs and extraterrestrial civilizations. Okay. Uh, let me just, we got a minute or two here. It, we started to get into that, but we didn't get into it very deeply. Um, one of the problems with aliens, <laughs> if I find, is that they're either real nice or they're out to remove your liver. Okay. And uh, we have people who uh, are on the show who, you know, float over their microphones who are absolutely convinced that the aliens, uh, you know, are, are out to save the planet and save the environment and make us all angels. You know, others uh, talk about the hideous experiences they've had with these cold, uncaring critters who, you know, do experiments on what, what, what say you about that? I mean, what are we looking at here? I mean, why sh should you, sh is it wise to go looking for these 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 people, even in meditation, I mean, what say you? Well, um, in one of the last chapters of our third book, we we talk about uh, we we talk about a uh, a planetary consortium of angels. Um, it may sound uh, Star Trekish, but uh, we we discovered that there are, in fact, uh, alien planets. That uh, well, at least alien to us, that are doing everything they possibly can to to help further the cause of of uh, I want to say humanity, but but good in the universe. But at the same time that we discovered them, they were also there to help protect planets like the Earth that haven't advanced as far as others from these these. Uh, and the only other word to use is uh, evil that exists out there. Mm. So, yes, we've discovered both. Okay. Well, that's um, a wise approach, I think. I think to assume one thing one way or the other can be dangerous. Anyway, tell us about your books. Well, uh, three three books so far. Uh, the first uh, deals with the techniques. The, the, reason, the reason it got started was that... Uh, I believe that most uh, individuals think that all of this is science fiction. And uh, after spending a good 15 years uh, working with hundreds of different people, um, a lot of what I had uh, come across was verifiable. And so I, I, Bonnie and I both decided to, to try to put together something that would help people realize that it indeed was uh, real and not science fiction. That was the first book. It's got, uh, oh, probably ten of our, our favorite uh, mind travels. We probably have uh, maybe not a thousand, but close to that over the years. Uh, transcripts of those travels so that people can actually read what, uh, what we're experiencing as we're doing it. Uh, the second book is something that actually came to Bonnie in the middle of the night. Uh, it's, it's more on the, the religious side of things. Uh, has everything from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, uh, not all, but most of our travels that have to do with the Old and the New Testament. 
And uh, the third book, as we've described already, is uh, called UFOs Through the Eyes of the Traveler. Mm -hmm. uh, a fourth book that we're considering doing is uh, a book called Myths and Legends Through the Eyes of the Traveler. Um, it, it, it will deal with some of the things that you've probably talked about many times, um, everything from uh, Bigfoot to fairies and, and those kinds of things, but also uh, the kinds of legends that exist in the current world. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so, like urban legends. Well, uh, legends, legends perhaps uh, that may that may cross the boundaries of religion. Uh, we we so we did a whole book on on Christian type of uh, myths and legends, like Christ and and uh, Abraham and all of those, even the Garden of Eden and the flood. What what about uh, what about the the myths and legends uh, that deal with Buddha or with uh, Muhammad? Or with any of the Hindu gods, so that's that's part of the uh, the concept as well. Okay, very good. And people can get these from Amazon or uh, probably your... off of our website. Okay, okay, could you website. repeat the website again, please? Uh, RespiteMindTravel.com. Very good. Okay, well, uh, and can I give you uh, the last word, Bonnie? You got anything uh, you'd like to leave us? Any thought you'd like to leave us with? Well. <laughs> I would encourage everyone to do this because I feel it opens your mind to uh, realities that you never knew existed. Okay. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us today. Very interesting subject. We only scratched the surface. We've got to have you back. And best of luck with your course and with your work. Thank, thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, folks, BehindTheParanormal.com is our show website. Find out about all our guests coming and going. And on our regular Sunday show tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 Pacific, on CBS New Sky Radio, NewSkyRadio.com, we'll plunge into a very weird, some might say delightful, corner of the paranormal when we welcome back a delightful guest, Cassandra Eason, British author, folklore expert, naturalist, and paranormal maven, author of 80 books. How do you do that? We'll be talking about nature spirits and almost universal legends of little people, fairies, and their origins. So check out our website at www.behindtheparanormal.com and your local radio schedules for the cities where CBS carriers are show. I don't know why I say carriers. It's carries our show. And the website where you can hear us from anywhere. And remember, you can always get free podcasts of all shows along with show schedules and guest information at www.behindtheparanormal.com. So many thanks to our sainted producer, the great Dave Richards himself, and we'll see you next Saturday, May 15th, on onworldwide.com and WON 1240 AM here in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley. And we will welcome paranormal expert and historian Robert Stanley, who actually is a rather local fellow. Uh, he, I believe he lives in Barrington, Rhode Island for a discussion of UFOs and Native Americans. There are lots of stories of Native Americans and UFOs. Oh, excellent. Excellent stuff. Uh, I'm having a little trouble with my quote of the day here. So in the meantime, we leave you with a quote from our old friend, Albert Einstein. The only reason for time is so that everything does ha doesn't happen at once. You got it. See you next week. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.